more over here. There's a, a really popular library in the Ruby world called Sidekick, and it's designed to be a background worker library. So if you have something like, oh, shoot, you know, I, I'm signing in, but I got a, a user just registered, but I have to go send them an email or, hey, I need to uh, like send out a push notification, those kinds of things. Um, obviously, you don't want to handle those in your web request because that would slow everything down. Uh, plus, if like email is unavailable, that might return an error. It's uh, some of these things you want to, you know, just do later, not right now, do them somewhere. And also, uh, it's totally fine if you, uh, uh, if it fails, because I, I want you to just retry it until it works. Um, so Sidekick on the Ruby world is a really popular implementation of this. Uh, it's backed by Redis. And what I wanted to do for fun was port this to Rust. There's actually a few other ports of this library, but one thing that I wanted to do was make it use Tokyo by default. So everything is asynchronous. And then there are a few, uh, last time on this lightning round, I shared the middleware stack or how uh, developers can add pieces of code into the request. So, hey, do this email later, right? I can validate that. Yeah, I could write any custom code, code I want to to modify that job or change that job um, as I'm going, or or halt things if it, if someone's not paying for a premium feature, right? Like you can do whatever you want by injecting code uh, in the stack as it's being executed. Um, today, I just wanted to do a quick little update on that, which is uh, a quick overview. This is what a worker implementation looks like. Um, on the right hand side, you can see. Uh, I can define some worker struct. I can um, uh, implement some custom functions like you would implement on any other struct. And then down here, uh, this is an implementation of a worker. This is kind of what I wanted to hit one more really important thing, um, where one really important thing I wanted to implement with Sidekick Rust, this port I'm doing, is I wanted the arguments of the worker to be strongly typed. Uh, in the in the Ruby world, everything's like a hash, an array, or a string, right? And uh, in Sidekick, within Ruby, there's no it's no different. It's just everything's a hash. And here, I wanted to make it uh, a challenge for myself to to use uh, Certy for uh, serialization and deserialization, and that would allow me to create this really cool, strongly typed worker interface. So when you implement a worker, you choose your arguments, which are a a strongly typed argument, and then you can implement this perform function. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff to find for you, but you can also overwrite options to put them in different queues. Um, uh, you could do whatever you want. But this is an implementation. Uh, and on the left hand side here, I have just another example that's kind of more fully baked, start to finish. The one on the left hand side compiles. One thing that also um, I got requests for, and I'm going to run this demo here. Uh, this demo is just going to enqueue a job every second, and then the worker is going to process it. One um, one thing Sidekick ships with by default is this admin UI. And so uh, one thing I wanted to implement for uh, this implementation was integration with this Sidekick web. So. You can see there are different queues. You can see what's busy. You can see the memory utilization and how long these have been running. Um, so with this in place, uh, you, these jobs complete so quickly. I'll, I'll do like one quick example, and then I'll end this demo. But if we take these jobs, for example, and say, hey, let's pretend that each of these takes like 10 seconds to complete. Um, we will see the worker start up in the Psychic Web on the right, and then we should start to see uh, work on this jobs table. It pulls every five seconds or so. Uh, and I'm on the wrong branch, so this is not going to work. <laughs> Sorry, but. That's what live demos are all about. Uh, you can see here, though, that it is keeping track of 
busy threads and um, uh, you could see, you know, different retry queues and other things that are going on. So it's just an update. Uh, it's still like fully featured, supports all the Sidekick features. Uh, it also now supports the Sidekick web. So if you have a Ruby app, you can have your Rust app uh, just start working and you'll be able to uh, see it with everything else. Lastly, uh, we support cron jobs. So if you have some kind of work you want to do periodically, like, hey, every day I want to go find the users that haven't signed in in 30 days and send them an email because, you know, whatever, and you want to go remind them to uh, sign in or any accounts that are over 90 days old that haven't paid that are, that are free, I want to deactivate them, right? Anything like that, put it on as a periodic job and uh, it'll work just fine. So that's kind of an overview of Sidekick Rust. Um, if you have feature requests, go ahead and make an issue and I'll implement it. Um, that's it. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, I should have switched the branch, but I'm not going to because that branch is like really, really, uh, well, I don't know. It, it works, but there's a Pope and Paul request. You can go read it if you want to see what I've done, but there's a lot of hackiness in there. Oh, don't worry. It is definitely your prerogative to decide how much you want to take on in live coding. <laughs> I just realized like I have this like finished thing that's basically like, you know, check out the main branch and pull all the latest commits into it. And it's kind of like my dopamine hit, like everything's merged. I hit finish, enter, and it's like, so good. And I totally sometimes eagerly hit finish and I did. So I don't even remember which branch I've got three named like process stats, real time job stats. And I can't remember which one is the open merge request or the open pull request. A judgment here. Well, nice. Thank you very much for presenting, Garrett. We appreciate you giving your lightning talk here. Um, as far as I know, uh, and AJ, uh, correct me if you're wrong here, but this uh, at this point, um, Garrett is the uh, the one lightning talk that actually showed up from initial RSVPs. So at this point, uh, I believe we are free to munch mingle. And if anybody else wants to take the mic and present on something cool, uh, you're welcome to do that. Uh, before uh, I sign off here, which is probably going to happen sometime soon, does anybody have uh, any questions for Garrett? Um, maybe not even necessarily pertinent to the talk. Do you have any questions about uh, the work Garrett's doing? Um, or maybe how he discovered Rust? I, I think that that's always an interesting question. I'll make that my question if nobody else has anything else that they'd like to put in the queue. So I was curious in seeing uh, what the uh, what the boundary looks like where you're actually passing the um, arguments into the worker. So uh, you mentioned like making those arguments strongly typed. Uh, you you know using sturdy. Um, I'm I'm interested in seeing that piece in particular. If we could dive into some source. Yeah, uh, if you don't mind, I could just share my screen again and we can look at some code. Yeah, you bet. Um, I was waiting for someone to be like, you haven't stopped sharing yet. <laughs> close, <laughs> close the messaging app <laughs> or something. No. Uh, so uh, for those, is this going to be source code of the, the project that's in GitHub? Yes. Do you want me to pull um, up on GitHub instead? So I actually, there are people in chat asking if we could get the repo link. Uh, I'm oh, sure yeah. part of that is so that they can follow along too. Let me pull that in here. It's technically called, the crate is called Rusty Sidekick because again, there's like four other implementations, but I named it Sidekick RS and um, yeah, so that's kind of what I'm using. Okay, so uh, I think Andrew was asking that question. This is what um, like the kind of more feature with a bunch demo with a bunch of stuff in here looks like. Yeah, um, sure. I have this, if we zoom in on this section here, 
I have this uh, a bunch of things that are implemented for you on the trait. And one of those things is like this options, right? And so the options allows you to specify a queue that you want to drop this into. Sidekick does have the concept of queues. They're just different like named lists inside of Redis. So nothing super fancy there, but it is a way of like segregating your work um, for an application. And then uh, there's in Sidekick, the convention is to call perform async on some worker like on, as a class method. Uh, so here, um, it is expecting you to return to put in this payment reports argument as you enqueue some work into Sidekick. Um, so I call this out to say, if you're calling on the worker directly, then by default, you're going to uh, the, it will fail to compile if you're not using the strongly typed argument. Um, that said, you can kind of work around it because I create this convenience function on the crate itself, which is just this perform async, where I let you provide some kind of class or worker name uh, and some queue and, uh, and some arguments. And these arguments can be anything you want. You can actually call sturdy JSON. Uh, it has this like JSON macro where you can say user grid uh one two three or something so with that version of the api like when you pass in payment report args like it, is that actually using the derive serialize and derive deserialize exactly so by, the, by the time it hits the worker it's just json by the time it hits redis it's just json and i and so to, to point that out here you can actually enqueue the json directly you can you can enqueue by bypassing the strongly typed args um and that's actually necessary because suppose you're in Rust and you want to call some worker that's defined in Ruby land, um, you know, you sometimes just have to break that around. That said, you can still you can still pass in the strongly typed arguments through this like sidekick perform async function. So you can still make it really strongly typed and then kick it off into some worker in the Ruby world. But um, yeah, that's how that works. And then um, it, in the uh, middleware down here, there's like a, I think it's like a, called a handler middleware. Middleware stack is kind of with like a build into, so you can extend it yourself if, you, if you'd like to. This is what um, it looks like. Um, there's this worker.call function, which may not look as this is kind of like where we're going to get into the weeds and it gets like a pretty crazy with rust because like there's some things you have to do in the type system or you can't necessarily it's like you can't have um like a generic uh type parameter where the type parameter can change inside of a data structure right so if you do something that's like oh i want some vec of t once T is pegged to a type, you can't have it be like T is a string and it's an integer, right? So in order to make it a data structure work with like a T or some like integer or some string or some whatever, you kind of have to get creative. And what, the way I did this was like, I created a new type that wrapped the whole concept of like this different type. Um, and it's actually just a, a Lambda function that gets called. So this will dispatch it with the proper type but what that looks like under the hood is, um, uh, let's see where it actually calls perform. Um, I can't remember where it is in the code now. Uh, but essentially, it just uses Serdy to say, like, you know, take the type that we are, we are supposed to cast it into, and then put that into the argument so that it does compile as a strongly typed thing. Mm, gotcha. Sorry, I'm not really, I, I, the last time I touched this code was like three months ago. The whole, the, the last time I've been, all I've been working on recently, I should say, is uh, like the sidekick web stuff. But I'm gonna look for it really quick. Um, any other questions? Otherwise I'll just hand it back over. I don't wanna hog the podium. 
Well, thanks for walking through that. That's awesome. Sure. Oh, here it is. Found it. Um, so when we invoke the worker, this is where we have some particular worker type, and then we can get the args, which is this type that we pass in, that's the, the 30 one, whichever we use, um, as part of this invoke set. So here's like this worker ref, like I said, where we create this like function, um, lambda, and that's where we start passing types in. So the, it's a way of like rolling up types inside of a type, which is again, not where we need to be going in this particular talk, but uh, eventually it does get unrolled and deserialized and then passed into the worker with its uh, strongly typed parameter. But you can see it's just parses the JSON and then pushes it in. That's it. Very cool. Now, uh, I think that that kind of winds down that technical question. Am I reading that right, Garrett? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I asked because I am actually really interested. Um, it's been a while since I've been able to meet with everybody here since I moved to Florida, um, but still love keeping tabs, still love uh, getting to know everybody. I was kind of curious what brought you to the rest world. Uh, I've been following Rust for a long time, and uh, I, I, you know, I was doing Ruby for a long time. I started doing GoLang, and then Rust came out. I'm like, oh, Rust is really cool, uh, but I wish it had more of like this async runtime because 90% of what I'm writing in software is build a query, send to the database, get the response, turn it to JSON, send it over the API, and so it was really hard for me to throw away the like nicer runtime that Golang has for that specific use case. Um, but then uh, async started rolling around and I really just started rolling my sleeves up and jumping into it. Um, and yeah. Then it started becoming work relevant, yo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, you know, we don't do a ton of Rust at uh, MX where I work, which is like across the street from Vivint um, for the uh -huh. meetup meets. But uh, you know, I, the one thing that I am running is uh, a Kubernetes operator. I thought, hey, this kubrs crate looks pretty cool. But can we, you know, write a fully functioning kube operator? And I ended up writing something that just watches for deploys and says, hey, this deploy finished successfully. If you'd like to, you can run a job. So we use that to um, like schedule, uh, you know. A common thing is when a deploy finishes, that service may say, hey, I just rolled out a change. I'd like to go run any pending database migrations. Um, and so I, uh, we use that to roll out migrations as things are being deployed. And I can demo that. It's totally fine. But I think uh, I probably talk too much at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I think what he's really saying is that he's hungry for some pizza. Yeah, I would eat pizza if I was in the building and willing to eat pizza, but I am just here remote. Man, somebody get this man some pizza. Thank you so much, Garrett, for taking the time. This was wonderful. For sure. Thanks. So... I'm, I'm going to suggest we just kind of go around and uh, do a little bit of introduction so we can get some natural conversation. And um, maybe I have uh, screaming, jumping kids in the background, but I do have a presentation prepared that I might be able to do. Um, maybe. We'll see. We can hear you pretty good, so fire away, man. Okay. Well, first, let's just go around and, uh, you know, introduce wh where, you, where you're at, what brought you here, and what brought you to Rust. 
and I, I'll start with that. Uh, so I'm I'm AJ. I am the uh, the word reluctant isn't quite right. It's not reluctant, but I'm the the meetup happened to fall into my lap. I dropped it on him. <laughs> yeah. So I I try to keep the meetup. Um, going and it goes and and we have um, you know lots of lots of people that cycle through and lots of people that stick around lots of smart people and so it's it, it's kind of I just want to rub shoulder with pe- shoulders with people that are smarter than I am and something that I don't know that much about so despite being in charge of the meetup for about a year and a half two years I don't know how long it's been um, I I pretty much don't very much know Rust at all. <laughs> Um, I've done a couple of projects in it, but I'm just kind of here mainly just to rub shoulders and kind of keep my ear to the ground and, um, you know, find out, are we rust yet? You know, yesterday Meta just barely uh, made a publication announcing that Rust has made it as uh, part of their exclusive set of approved server-side languages. What was that that did it? Meta. So the what was previously known as Facebook. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was like, what? What are you saying? What word is that? Okay, got it. Yeah, let me grab the link here. All right. Well, there's engineering. Boom. Put it there in chat. Well, let's just go uh, alphabetically, or I don't know if everybody sees the same order that I see, so I'll say alphabetically. The two I'll, I'll, I can go first if you want me to, actually. I, I got to drop here in a second, but I'd, I'd love to yeah, ask do it. a question and then uh, hightail it. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Eric Goobler. Uh, I have to turn join. on the, the video so we can see you. That's true. Let me do that. All right. How am I doing? Can everybody see me? Nope. Uh oh. Now we can. So you're good now. All right. Hi, uh, I'm Eric. Uh, I actually started this meetup like a long freaking time ago now. <laughs> I think it was uh, 2018, 2019 uh, when we first started it. And I discovered Rust um, like 2017 and started playing with it for about a year. And in 2018, I said, oh, my gosh, uh, I think that Rust solves some genuine problems. And I think that this is just going to keep growing. So the, I decided to hit my career uh, into that bet. And uh, I helped push things along for a couple of years. Then I moved to Florida. I had the, the temerity to move away. Um, but, uh, still very much enjoy the community in Utah Rust. Um, folks here are fantastic. Uh, I've been working professionally in Rust for the last, um, three and a half years now, and I've enjoyed it immensely. Um, my most recent gig is at NZXT, uh, where I've been using Rust to, uh, do a lot of the back end for their product called Cam. They actually had layoffs last week, um, so now I'm no longer part of that team. A whole bunch of people aren't, um, but I still get to keep all the skills that I got with me working with uh, USB devices, USB HID, uh, writing kernel drivers <laughs> in Rust even, and um, even doing stuff like uh, writing in against motherboard support where I'd have to know, understand the IO address space and... Yeah, <laughs> wild ride. I loved it. Um, very excited to keep going in Rust and currently on the job hunt right now. So I have time to be social. Let's see. The next step I see in the alphabetical order after AJ would be Andrew. Cool. I will go next. And here, I will be courageous and turn on my camera. So, uh, I'm Andrew. Um, yeah, and yeah, Eric, good luck on the job search. Like, hope, 
hope that goes great for you. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm based in Vineyard. Uh, work at a company in Lehigh called Podium. Uh, we don't use Rust at Podium, but someday maybe we will. Um, and I came to Rust several years ago, maybe three or four years ago. Uh, was interested in using it for like embedded electronics and digital signal processing. Um, I, I don't really do a whole lot of that at work, but I, I tinker a whole lot at home. Uh, I do a lot of like, I don't know, here's, here's an example. I do a lot of like synthesizers and stuff. So like this is a voltage controlled oscillator. And so what I want to do with Rust, among other things, is I want to build digital synthesizers uh, with Rust. And I think that'll be a cool thing. Um, also open to maybe eventually um, taking a job in Rust. I think that'd be very cool. Uh, in terms of like projects I've done with Rust, um, uh, I did one cute little CLI, really like a terminal UI that wrapped Blender. So uh, whenever you want to run Blender on the terminal, it's like standard error output is just a huge, crazy mess. Um, so I built a TUI to like consume all of its logs and then aggregate them into something that's more readable. Um, and so I used that to make a very poor man's like render farm uh, when I wanted to do a, an animation project. Uh, and then I started a TUI for Kafka. Um, so just interacting locally with a, with a set of Kafka brokers um, and, and trying to do some things that like, uh, like deployed web-based Kafka UIs are maybe less good at um, just being able to like really quickly look at like the state of a of a kafka cluster like from your terminal while you're in like tinkering um yeah so those are those are some forays that i have made into rust so far my next i think uh let's see if my camera will actually turn on hey look at this uh i probably should have turned on when i was um you know, presenting, that would have been better. But I've been to the meetup a few times. I'm Garrett Thornburg. Uh, I just presented one of the projects that I've been working on on the side. And then I kind of answered about what got me into Rust. So <laughs> I don't know what else to really add to that other than it's really fun. And I'm hoping that we get more, uh, well, I know there's like the, are we async yet? And that's answer nope. is true now, but I'm hoping we get more, uh, oh, there's a, there a blog post published recently that talks about like all the things that we wanna, that they are hoping to see happen in the async world to make it more available to newer developers and let fewer edge cases. And I think that's pretty cool. It sounds like the office just showed up. So hello. Hey Nathan. How are you doing? Okay, so we just got started and I asked for volunteers to do the Jitsi and sharing and I got none. So I'm doing it. And <clears throat> Chrome's like giving me all sorts of oh my gosh. I'm gonna have to restart Chrome. Just a minute. Yeah, I bet you. Let's see. Yeah. Unlock Google Chrome. Quick. Okay, right, bye. I'm back. Oh, look at that. We have an even younger Rustation with us today. We also have Laura, who is eight years old, and she's over there. Oh, and AJ's got another a whole, whole, a whole, a whole passel. Okay, I'm gonna try sharing screen again. Share screen, tire screen, maybe share. Yeah, can you guys hear us? Okay, I saw a head nod, so that's yeah, a good. Thing. Good. Hey. Oh look, I'm doing the like, the like inception thing. Uh, let's go over here to this window. All right, so this is my show and tell today. This is my little nine day project. Here's my 
Xbox controller, and I've got two controls. I can turn and I can go forward. And this is my show and tell. This is my the, the, the beginnings of a little 2D game. And all I can do right now is run into these little asteroids. And that's it. And the asteroids are turning very slowly. And that's my show and tell. To the controller uh, with Bevy. Uh, I had to turn the controller on. So, oh, that's right. I had to connect to the laptop, which for Apple was going to the Bluetooth menu and clicking on it. So it wasn't bad. Oh, well, I mean, to be fair, I did have to hold this button right here to set the controller in pairing mode. And it blinked. So many steps. It is a lot of steps. Well, and then here, since we're doing show and tell, and this is all about Rust, here is my gamepad system. Okay, so this is Bevy. This is just like setting up my ECS stuff, and you can see I, I was rapidly prototyping, so I was commenting stuff out, and trying different things. But when it came down to it, there's my control code for my gamepads. No, not too bad. Um, I, I just hooked them up to to uh, physics using the Rapier 2D Bevy plugin, and so with the game pads, I calculated my force force going forward and my torque for turning, and then I just threw that over the physics system, and it took care of the actual movement and collision detection. So, although to be fair, this which one was it? One of these somewhere. Somewhere, one of the turning things I got distracted for like three of my quote unquote days uh, contributing to the leaf wing input manager, some turning code and stuff like that, but, and access code. The rest of the game code? So this is all of it. This file is all of it. So there's 276, 77 lines of it. So let's see, uh, here's like initialization and like tying all the systems into the game engine. Here's some constants for like layers and sprite size. I've got this asteroid component that just, asteroids just uh, rotate at a fixed velocity and I, that's set by that attribute right there. Uh, I've got a marker component for a player so I can tell which sprite is the player. I attach that component to them. I don't know if you noticed, but my little flames had three different levels, tiny, small, and medium. So depending on how far I'm pushing forward on the stick, it has a different little flames. Here's like the thrust event for like which direction am I thrusting in so that I can take that over to the physics and apply it. Here's my setup code. So this is, this is the code for, hey, or this one line makes it so that if I change a sprite on disk, it notices and reloads it in the live game. So that's really, really nice for rapid prototyping when you're working on the graphics. That's the line for setting up my 2D camera in Bevy. And then it gets more complicated. So like this is the player ship from here down to here. And the bulk of it is those three different flames. So there's the three different flames. Each one of them takes a big thing like this. So I have to know where to load the image in, where it is relative to the parent sprite, uh, whether it's visible or not, if they're not, because by default, you're not going yet. And then rinse and repeat for the three different sizes, plus the things like the marker, marker component for he's the player and the physics setup. And yeah. And then down here we got, here's the medium asteroid so I set him up. Here's the sprite image that we use. Here's where he's going to be. Here's how big he's going to be. Uh, here, here's the interaction with the physics plugin. I'm saying he's kinematic, which means you, that you control him. You don't like you don't give him forces and he goes off. He's kinematic. You control him in the physics system. And then this here is setting up two triangles for the colliders. So I got <laughs> this actually took a long time just like guessing the different um coordinates and stuff and there's this nice debug renderer for physics if we run that and you can see those two triangles on each of my asteroids come on so would be a lot harder to have the code detection based on the actual sprite 
Uh, I don't know how to make it. So yeah, the the physics the physics system takes takes triangles, so or polygons or that uh, tessellates. Uh, actually, no. I think it only does it only. I think it only takes triangles. What does it take? Physics system, asteroid. Oh yeah, there's different kinds of colliders. And since I was just starting out, I chose the triangle and I made triangles. So each of these has see those yellow ones. Those are the colliders that I made. Yeah, it only actually collides on that yellow triangle. I just got it close enough that it was good enough for prototyping. Right? And then, you notice the flames, the flames, they don't, they're not part of the physics system. Right? And the collider for the ship is, you can't see it because it's so overlapping the edge of the ship, but there's a rectangle around the ship for its own collider. And those greens are the bounding boxes, and I'd turn those off if I could, but I haven't found an option for that. Oh, I want to do something like that. I, I'm not sure where I'm going with the game, but I would love to do stuff like that. The, the, the TLDR for my game concept is, how can I make a Stardew, Stardew Valley-like game in an asteroid field where I'm like, farming the asteroids or something and that's about as far as i got so <laughs> so yeah why did i choose bevy i feel like it's the most promising rust game engine right now so the the, the other real big one like i want to i, I want to learn a game engine really well i want it to be in rust and i want to be able to use it for all my projects so bevy is a general purpose game engine so it does 3d and 2d it has a huge community, lots of inertia. It's got a you know benevolent benevolent dictator for life who works full time on it, and so I just really like it. I've been a contributor for for a while now. Um, there's some other prominent ones like Macroquad and Firox and stuff, but they all have their own pros and cons and what they're aiming for and what capabilities they have. And Bevy is what I chose, what I like. So far, so far, so well. I mean, when I when I started doing the gamepad stuff, first I used the raw gamepad stuff in Bevy, and it was a little bit bigger. And like, you have to. I wanted to be able to combine to use the keyboard or the gamepad, or a mouse, or like different input modes, and have it combine it. And I didn't want to write all that myself because that would be really annoying. So I went around and looked, and I found an input manager plugin called Leafwing. Um, for Bevy. And so I started using that and it did everything except for it didn't support analog axes on gamepads yet. So I was able to do everything I wanted except for like literally the thing that I started with. So I went and helped um, my friend actually started working on access input before I even went and looked. And then he finished that up and I helped polish it. And then there was some turning stuff that wasn't quite right. And so I contributed fix to that. So, so like, it's very alpha. Like there's a lot of missing pieces. Bevy doesn't have an editor. It's only Rust source code, right? They're, it's under rapid development. Every three months they have a big release and they break lots of stuff and improve lots of stuff. But they, I really like their roadmap. They've been on a really good, found, they've been they focused first a lot on the ECS and then Lately, the last couple of releases, they focused on the deep rendering subsystem and like really meshing it together with ECS and stuff. And they're like moving upwards from there, going on this logical progression. And they, they're going to have an editor and they're going to have skeletal animation systems and all that kind of stuff. Like it depends on what you mean by added, right? Like, yeah, they built some of it. But I mean, this is just VS Code. Yeah. No, a custom custom thing based on Monokai. Yeah, yeah. I, I heavily customized the colors, but I started from that Sublime old Sublime theme years ago. Yeah, good days, huh? All right. Well, that. Did any more questions or, or anything like that? We went over almost all of the code. So. I think the previous 275 went to the one.
Right. Yeah, it's not bad. But when you have a, when you have like a engine or something like it does something. Yeah. Well, and, and Rapier is a really good game engine, physics for game engines package, and they they write their own Bevy plugins. You know, so I was able to get physics for free. Yeah. Yeah. With all sorts of libraries that aren't part of the game engine itself, that you can plug in and get go, and you get all the value of the viewer that you're really focused on that. Yeah. It's not coupled to the actual Bevy system, and if they want to, if somebody wants to make a new one that's even better, you can just drop exactly. it and swap through it. It doesn't require Bevy updates. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, when I when I polish this up, I'll I'll take my own code and package it into my own plugins just for organization's sake. I've done that on past Bevy projects. Okay, cool. We should give someone else a chance here. So go ahead and well, I guess there's nothing I really need to do on here except for stop sharing my screen. Stop sharing. All right. Who's next? Uh, if you want to get on. If you want to get on uh, Jitsi, you could share your screen just like I did. And if you don't get on, I'll leave my camera and stuff on. Well, I don't. You don't. You guys don't need the camera when I'm not talking. So I'm going to stop my camera. Have you done anything in the 3D part of the library? No, I, just little tiny tests of things. Like I, I tried getting my brother. My brother is a sculpt, a digital sculptor. So I had him export one of his ZBrush sculptures oh, to okay. a GLTF format, and I tried loading it in Bevy, and it worked. Really? I was like, whoa, and it looked really cool. But like, he, he, he oh, no, no problem. I'll just. There's no audio. I think Nathan just muted his microphone. Oh, just a second. We're trying to transfer to someone else. How's that? There you go. We've we've got sound and tailorception. Okay. If I talk, is it come up? Yep. yep. I think so. Good. Okay. Jitsi folks can hear. <laughs> yeah, we can hear. Okay. Am I good to go? You're good. Okay. So I have a story to tell. I was reading about uh, another programming language called Coca. And uh, this is a really cool, just kind of uh, research project. Uh, it's a it's a functional programming language. So I'm a I'm a huge language guy. I'm doing a master's at the U right now, doing language stuff, and uh, so and I love functional programming as well. Uh, I know this isn't necessarily a functional programming group, but some people might know what I'm talking about. Um, and in in functional programming, a lot of times you make pure functions, which are functions that just take some input and produce some output and don't produce any side effects. They don't mutate anything. If you give them the same thing, they'll always produce the same thing. That's And that's just kind of the style of programming you want to do a lot in function programming. You get a lot of benefits from it, and you can you can find out more about that. Um, but in this language here, uh, they've been doing a lot of cool stuff with the compiler. And uh, one of the things the compiler does is, well, OK, so backing up, in function programming, a lot of times you, you, you're not mutating anything. So often you'll take a data structure and then copy it in order to produce a modified version of it rather than mutate it in place. That's a really common thing to do in functional programming. As you can imagine, it's not super efficient and it uses a lot more memory. Um, you kind of need a lot more garbage collection with that. So what this language is doing is 
it's statically analyzing uh, to see if um, a data structure you've used is not going to be used again after you've done some operation on it. And so it says, well, instead of creating a new one, I'm just going to mutate it in place and pretend that we're doing everything purely functional. Uh, and so it, it'll analyze that and then put that in if it thinks that it can do that. And so I thought, well, we can kind of do that manually with Rust just using ownership. Um, so I thought of uh, creating a stack data type that um, instead of uh, instead of doing something like giving it a reference that it mutates to do its operations, it for the user of the stack, it's as if you're doing pre functional programming, but under the hood, it's actually mutating it. So let me just kind of like show what I'm talking about here. So I've created this stack here, and I'll I'll show you what this product is later if you're interested. Um, is you uh, so you have your push, your peak, your pop. Uh, the thing I want to direct your attention to is push and pop here. So for push, we take in mutable self, and then we under the hood we're just using a vec, um, and we push that vec, and then we just return ourselves. Um, same idea with pop. We take mute self, we pop the thing off the stack, and then we return a tuple of the value and the new stack after the pop has been complete. So to the caller of this API, oh, hang on, let's see here. Where's the caller? So the caller, it's as if you're doing something for the functional. I have a stack. And I want a new stack that is this stack as if you pop, push something onto it or pop something off of it. So down here, um, I'm just uh, executing. Why don't, why don't we look at what this project is, actually? This is probably a good time. So if I do um, cargo run. So this is a, a little uh, stack-based programming language I made. Uh, probably a lot to explain, but if you've ever done anything like APL, uh, think of it as APL meets fourth. Uh, fourth is a stack-based language where uh, you put words together, and then it executes each one, and each one will do something to a stack that's running along. So this language has a stack, but each value is a, is a matrix, and so the um, operations we're doing on it are matrix operations. So just kind of like show it off. Uh, it, and, you know, I say one, I put one onto the stack. I say one, two, I put one and then a two onto the stack. Um, and then I can take that and add them together. And these are actually just matrices. So um, I can put them together into their own matrix. I can create another matrix on that stack, and then I can add them together like that. And there's a couple other things we can do, and you can we can play with it more if you're interested. So for this language, we have values and we have words. Words act on the stack. So this is what this execute thing is doing here. It's taking um, an expression, which can be a number or a word, and then it's taking a stack and it's performing that action on the stack. And instead of performing it and you know doing it kind of imperatively, it's actually doing it in a purely functional way from our perspective here at execute, which is just uh, doing the push and then returning whatever that value comes out to be. Um, so then down here, uh, we can execute a whole line by creating one stack, getting, you know, tokenizing our, our whole expressions, our whole program basically, which is just a line right now. Uh, creating expressions out of it by parsing them. And then we just say that our new stack is the old stack after it's been folded over with all these expressions. And isn't that just so elegant, right? No, no references, no mutation, just folding along. But the cool thing is, is that with the ownership semantics, it automatically makes it so that any previous reference to the stack is invalidated as soon as we transfer ownership. 
So there's always only one stack in memory the whole time. There's just one identifier that can look at it. So I don't know what the consequences of this are. I just thought it was a cool thing. Uh, so yeah, any questions? So why are you taking new self instead of taking self by value? That's a good question. So it's because I, I am actually mutating under the hood. Um, cause I, it, yeah, so if I got rid of this, for example, uh, then I would expect this to break saying that, um, yeah, we can't borrow as mutable to change the underlying vector. But couldn't you take ownership of self? Wouldn't that be more consistent with what you're trying to do? I mean, it's yeah, it is taking ownership of self, actually. Um, it's, this is actually something I learned trying to do this, was just putting mute there. You're taking ownership of it, but you're taking ownership of it oh, mutably. Yeah, you're not, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you took it as a reference, then you'd be borrowing. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it, it, your ownership would stay back, but we're, we're passing ownership. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like backwards to how you normally think when you're writing Rust. Like, because usually you're thinking, well, I want to keep it up here where it's been used. I'm just going to let it borrow down here. And then, you know, when we come up, we still have it. In this case, it's like, no, take it. <laughs> take it. And you know, I don't want to ever use this again. Give me back something, and then I'm going to use that, <laughs> you know? But actually, I think Rust intended to be used that way. I mean, I think that's, I mean, you can use it either way. It makes perfect sense to me. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting, huh? Because... Because it, it is nice, you can kind of, uh, from the API perspective, like the user of the, of the uh, you know API here, it's like you're using pure functions, but we're cheating. Actually, there's all we're not doing any copying, and we are using the semantics of the language to invalidate the old versions, so that oh, yeah. so that you're never referring to something that's invalid or <laughs> old old news. So, yeah, I'm not sure exactly when you want to use this. It was kind of fun to use it in this experiment. Uh, but yeah, I just thought it was interesting. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Are you sharing Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm turning my microphone back on while we're finding someone else. So I have something that I might be able to present. My daughter's now on the Nintendo, and my son here actually loves looking at the screen. So I may actually be able to do my short lightning talk after all. Okay, when? Right now. Right now? All right, right. AJ's up. All right, so we're let me see and share my screen. Uh, yeah, uh, here, hand me the... Do, 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 do. It's a very nice clock. Okay, am I sharing my screen? Uh, yes, you are sharing your screen, and I'm getting my screen, sharing your screen up on the wall screen. Oh, great. <laughs> Excellent. All righty. Here it comes. Okay, so this is really not for the people in this room. This is, this is more for people that are Rust curious and uh, they're dealing in other languages. So I wanted to talk about shadowing because I, I think it's really simple and neat and something that a lot of other people aren't necessarily familiar with. Uh, so useful links, but if you want to see this presentation, it is beyondcodebootcamp.github.io and then the video will go here as well. Uh, we can just skip uh, this because it would take longer to, to do all that. Oh, except for if you do find the Utah Rust channel useful and you are watching online along with us, consider like, sub, and follow. Uh, okay, so shadowing, uh, variable shadowing is what I'm, what I'm talking about. And it's a very, very simple concept. Uh, it's for when you want to reuse the name of a variable for a different thing. So what that looks like is this. And in, um, in some languages, you can you can redeclare a variable, but it doesn't actually have meaning. It doesn't do what you might think it does. In Rust, if you declare a variable as a string, and then you uh, redeclare the variable, 
you can redeclare it as a different type. And this is why it's useful. This is kind of the canonical example. So the scenario is, I think the, the, the most common one is when you're taking user input in some, some format, whether that's from uh, a web form or from a command line argument or just somehow, some way, shape or form, you're taking in probably strings, but maybe other things. Maybe, maybe you're getting something as an int and you need to convert it to a float or something like that. But um, yeah, so on the command line, everything is a string even when it's a number. And this is a little bit more uh, involved example than the one that I just showed you, but basically the same thing. And the, the traditional way of handling this problem, uh, the way that you have to do this in Go, which it is and unfortunately nasty, as well as uh, JavaScript, if you want to keep your types clean and most other languages, is you have to have something like hstr equals, and then you know get your argument, and and that's we're going to call it hstr. And then when you parse it, you're going to call it hnum. But then uh, storing type information in the name, calling something hstr, hnum, whatever, is kind of dumb. It's lame. And so instead, we can do what I just showed earlier, where you can, like I said, declare it as a string and then declare it again. But the, the important thing is that it's not because it's loosey-goosey. It's strongly typed. It's just that you're, you're, re you're allocating a new memory space and just allowing yourself to reuse the name. And that is what variable shadowing is. So, um, any questions on that? Uh, I've got a question. On line eight, after the equal sign, is that H stir? Is that supposed to actually be H? Yes, yeah, it is. That's just a typo. Okay. Good catch. I'll fix that. Okay. Any other questions? All right. How old is your son? How old is your son, AJ? He is 10 months. Ooh, 10 months. Is he crawling? Oh, he's more than crawling. He'll stand up and he'll take uh, two Ooh. cautious steps and then sit back down. Nice. So That's a fun age. Cool. Yeah. All right. Thanks, AJ. All right. Well, <laughs> My sure. Oh, boy. <laughs> Everyone's laughing because of all the clap, cl clapping brought up a, di a dialogue that says your microphone appears to be noisy all right who wants to be next you yeah, i'll do one tell me your name jason jason I'll, is next i'm on jitsi you're on jitsi share my screen so i will Unmuted. Let me you share want to share the screen. screen up on the wall, right? Oh, you go ahead and stay plugged in because okay. I'll just do it the same way that AJ did. So this is a a gist of a well, you'll see it in a second. Okay, hold on. Can people online hear us? Yes. Yep. Okay, cool. That's yep. <laughs> so so this is a, a gist of something that we worked on here at, at Vivint. By the way, I work here at Vivint, always hiring. We do Rust, so there's the plug. But um, but yeah, so I, I work on the camera vision team. So we run machine learning models on our cameras uh, and uh, analyzing frames in this case. And so I have these these images. I'm calling it a dynamic image. If you just look at this little main right here, I basically assume I got a, an image from the camera and uh, I have this dynamic foo model. So I have a model, it's a, a, a neural network that we're calling foo. It takes a dynamic image. You can see that it, it checks to make sure that our image has the right color space because we sometimes have to transform between like, hey, this is RGB, this is grayscale and stuff like that. And it makes sure that it has the, the right width and height and so forth. Like this is obviously very simplified here and, um, and it produces an output you know, is a number or, or, or whatever the output should be. Like here are the bounding boxes of, of all the people in the scene. Um, and then I have another model bar here that takes a, that takes an image, but it expects it to be in a different color space, in this case, grayscale, and it expects it to have a different width. And so uh, this works just fine. If you look at the, the main function here, 
I, I run, you know, I have the right kind of image. I run it through the foo model. I get some result. I transform the color space. I rescale it. And then I run it through the bar model. So this, this is just fine in, in dynamic, uh, the, the sort of um, not, not using compile time checks. Like these are all runtime checks to make sure, hey, you just passed foo model a dynamic image. Did it have the right color space and so forth? And this, so this is this is fine as is. Uh, and so now we're going to overcomplicate it with uh, with phantom types and things like that to <laughs> to take these runtime checks and turn them into compile time checks. So that's that's what I'm showing right here. Is I'm going to show some of the stuff we did. This again, simplified version of something that um, we'll find out if it's worth it or not. I'll, I'll, maybe I should say. The pain point that we're trying to solve in moving these to the compiler is we run a bunch of models on our camera. And we recently decided we're going to be running a, a whole bunch of models on our camera. And they take different inputs and things like that. And we can detect these, these sorts of things at runtime. Hey, you didn't do the right transformation here. We can even do things like have the models dynamically advertise. Hey, this is the sort of transformation you need to do for me. Um, but it's, it's harder for us to kind of um, make sure that we're being efficient as we do all these transformations. We don't want to, to be switching color spaces all the time, even where we're not losing information. Here, RGB to grayscale will lose information. But if I'm not going between YUV and RGB, maybe I'm not losing information. Um, at any rate, we, we wanted better ways to, to kind of at compile time, see the transformations we're doing and, and have the compiler tell us, hey, you forgot to do a transformation there. And so this is the the, again, perhaps overcomplicated. You know, ask us in six months if we're happy with with this <laughs> this change. But you'll notice. Um, so now I, I have the. So that's this is all the stuff for the dynamic image. You know, you can transform color space. You can transform scale. Okay, let's talk about the image now. So the image is is now parameterized by a color space, and it's parameterized by by a width here. I'm using this this phantom data. Uh, and and then I have this wraps one of those dynamic images that we defined above and we're using. So so this, by the way, is a, a nice way to put a, a kind of static interface on top of a, a dynamic um, struct. And so you can see we have this nice little try from implementation where you can give it a dynamic image and it'll just check to make sure you have the right color space and it'll check to make sure that you're the right width. And if so, now you have the, the compiler, like you've proved to the compiler that you are an image of, say, an RGB of 100 or whatever. And so I'm actually going to use this new main function. We can look at some of the details in a minute. So get rid of this old main function. Look at this new one. So this new one, I'm starting again with a dynamic image. And I do have some runtime checking. So for example, I, I try to turn it into this sort of static image, and I'd have to handle um, you know, in this case, this one fails because uh, the width I said is 90 here, or I want it to be 90, and I couldn't prove that to, like, it, I actually had a 100 there. So let's do it again. I, I guess I didn't even need to to do this, but yeah. So I've, I put it in there again, and now I'm, I'm using it as a 100. I can run it through the foo model, which I, I defined a kind of static version of my foo model where it's like, hey, I have to take an RGB that has a width 100. And I have a bar model. I have to take a grayscale, which is 100. And uh, now I can just call transform color space, and it automatically will transform it into the correct color space for bar model. And if it's not able to do that, then I'll get a compiler error. So, um, so for example, maybe I make bar model. And, and this, this also gives me a way to kind of, in my through traits, I can define the sort of graph of which ways I can go. Like I can go from RGB to grayscale. I can go from YUV to RGB and vice versa. But I can't necessarily go from grayscale back to RGB because I've lost information. So I want to. I want the compiler to tell me, no, 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 you you can't do this. So let's uh, let me. I have an extra deal there. So let me let me demonstrate that. So if I, for example, I have a. If I move the running the foo model, if I go back, if I go down here, running the foo model, and I transform the color space again, um, 
it should give me an error, which, which okay, it does. It says, hey, I, I can't do transform color space because, uh, actually, image, I need this to be RGB. And actually, I shouldn't need to give it quite so much type annotation here. Um, I just happen to have done so. So, so yeah, so it, it complains, hey, this is not implemented. And you can see these implementations. In our actual code, we use a lot of, of like, this boilerplate here is, is kind of gross. So we use some nice little macros that will handle this. So I can define all the edges of that, that graph of like what transformations are allowed and, and just put a couple of macros there. So it would just be four lines where it's like, hey, I can go from RGB to grayscale. I can go from YUV to grayscale. I can go between RGB and YUV. And that's all. So, so this is again. You'll notice it's a lot more lines of code uh, for for this interface. It it may be a little more restrictive than we need. We can out, we can always dive down into dynamic world um, because we've got this nice. We have this nice uh, static interface, and underneath you know, it's just wrapping the dynamic thing. Um, again, talk to us in six months. Maybe maybe we'll decide this was this was not worth the complexity. Uh, although it is done in such a way that it would be easy to remove it, to, to go back to just the sort of dynamic way of doing it. Anyway, um, any questions? Sorry if it hasn't been clear or whatever, but yeah. So you're saying the pros of your approach are less branching. You don't have those if statements, right? You're less dealing with the error types or the results. Yeah. Right? You, you find out at compile time. Yeah. So the con is... It takes a little more effort to set all that up. Yeah, that, that, that's those would be the, the main pros and cons of, of this. That doesn't look like it adds that much code to get the benefit. It doesn't here in part because we're only dealing with the color space and the, the width there. Um, it th there's a there's a fair amount of added complexity enough that as much as I like really like this, I'm like, oh yeah, this is good. Uh, <laughs> It's like uh, I I very well may say no. This is bad in, in a little <laughs> while. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that blows up, gets out of control. There, some of the things if you if you don't need to control the graph, if you're able to go from any one to any other, you can define like a general transformation and and implement it pretty widely. Like there, there are a lot of things you can do that way. You'll you'll notice the rescaling stuff I do here. Uh, is where is it? Uh, so the dynamic image has a scale. Let me just see. Okay, yeah. So here I have this uh, for any for any color space, any width. Uh, I'm allowing you to to scale. And actually, you'll notice this one. This still is dynamic. There's there's not a nice way in Rust right now to express the sort of thing where it's like, hey, this number is only allowed to go down. In this const generic, um, in fact, even like when when const expressions get added, that you wouldn't be able to express that idea of of sort of a constraint on it, saying, "Hey, it can only go smaller." Const expressions will allow you to be very specific about it can be this plus this or whatever. Um, so I this is maybe something after this, if someone has a better solution to to move this into kind of compile time checks, that would that would be cool. But anyway. So yeah, that's that's some of the stuff we've done with with like phantom types and stuff like that to, to kind of give us a, a uh, compile time checks on our transformations of of images. So can we see the compiler? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's let's give so like right here you're seeing one of them. They're terrible, right? Like it's like hey, I can't find this, um, and the reason why you can't find it is because we haven't defined it going from grayscale to sorry going from grayscale to RGB. We've defined it from RGB to grayscale, but not the other way around. So that's, that is another kind of downside of this, is that it becomes harder to, like, you get compile errors, but they're, they're not, like, super nice compile errors. It's, especially if you're kind of new to the project, it's going to be like, what's this complex error here? I don't know what this means. Um, so again, pros and cons. It's kind of straightforward. It's like, you didn't implement something. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. And it's not quite clear that what you didn't implement was that you're in a particular, you've got a particular you know, case right. from yep. error value that doesn't match. Whereas at runtime. I think that's something that they might be able to fix in the compiler and improve over time to better error messages. Yeah. As this becomes a pattern that they start to look 
Yeah, though, if you were using like the dynamic errors, like it's gonna be, you're gonna be able to write something really nice right there. Like can't convert from grayscale to RGB uh, at runtime. So it's, it, this definitely is a trade-off where it's kind of a little more opaque, especially if you're not as familiar with the code base or whatever. So and you're giving that up to the compiler. Yep. But you're also going to get it at compiler. Yeah, yeah. Right. Trade offs. You don't have to wait until it runs to get that. <laughs> That's right. There. That's right. Um, so, something maybe macros could do? Um, yeah, that's a good question. How, like, I, I don't know quite how to get my error into the, the compiler error, yeah. uh, even if I could kind of play with the code that way. The general advice regarding macros and generics is if you can use generics and, and const generics, yeah. use them. If not, then macros. That's that's just the general advice. It's in the books. Mm -hmm. So does this uh, cause it to be significantly higher compile time? You know, our it's hard to say. Our project has fairly high compile times anyway. So the the marginal cost of this is pretty low. Um, low enough that we we didn't like notice. Like, oh man, it's so much worse. I imagine in a smaller project, it would. You know, this is this is pretty significant uh, what we're adding to it. I mean, maybe we could just see how long this takes, even like this, just to. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's still broken because we broke it. Let's yeah, unbreak it. <laughs> yeah, that was, it's great. Well, I think I think I may have run. Yeah, it's fast. It's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, let's move foo model back up there, and that should fix it. I mean. It's hard to say. Oh, so uh, on a, a Mac, you're going to hold Option and you can kind of move it around. Option up and VS Code. VS Code. Sorry, yeah, not Vim. Sorry, sorry, Vim folks. I'm sure it does. Vim has everything. There's a plugin. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? Or okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, this this is not this is not yeah this is not proprietary. This is just a use of phantom types. That's good. I remember in the uh, the in John James that was like on the front page, so it's kind of a good thing. Yeah, it's useful for a lot of like um, state transition sort of things, which is really what's happening here. These are these are transformations. They're state transformations. The other thing is, uh, I noticed that this is something that a buddy of mine at work hates when he has a bunch of enum cases. It's like I need to do this. Case. Yeah, there is a very generic way, except the fact that it actually lets you basically constrain to a specific enum case instead of yep. uh, forcing the type. Yeah, so it's, it, it's interesting at that level. Even if you're not doing transformations, being able to write functions that constrain to I must be this instant this enum case. Yeah, otherwise it's going to blow up on you. One other thing I want to point out: um, I have a trait color space, which is sort of like my marker trait here. Um, or not marker trait, sorry. I have, I have a color space trait, and uh, I constrain my my color spaces. Like all of them implement that, and I can and each of them I have this sort of associated enum, the dynamic color space, and this is a nice way for me to kind of get a hold of what's the dynamic one, what's the enum value that's associated with this this struct oh, that I'm using here. Trait. Is that called trait attribute? Uh, I, yeah, I suppose so. I'm not certain what the it's an associated const, right? Yeah, it, associated const. So yeah, I do have an associated const Thank right you. here, and that's that's how I'm I'm doing this. And so this this does allow for some simplicity, and I can use this in a sort of like general purpose. In fact, I do I think I use this. I don't use this in these particular colors transform color spaces, but I could really quickly say, hey, I want you to be able to transform into any color space and uh, get rid of the say I had no constraints there, like I can transform between one. Or the other uh, as easy as you please. It would just look like, uh, and this is obviously a mistake to try to do this, but this would just look like um, so impl, I have a color space which has to be a color space, and I go and I have an, I guess, an out color space as well. Out CS, which is also a color space, and I go, so this will be my out color space. Oh, CS. This one will be my color space. And I can do something like I'm just going to do the dynamic version with whatever my out CS uh, 
what is it called? It's called, what do we call that? Instruct uh, Dyn color space is the name of the const. Dyn color space. And so now I have this general purpose one. Let's see, oh, I can't be RGB. This needs to be out CS. And actually, I guess I don't need my color space here because I just need the one that I'm, no, I do need it because it constrains right there. Okay. So I need this. So now I have it implemented generally. So it can do any sort of transformation between the color spaces. So if, if you don't want to limit your transformation graph, I can, I can use that uh, associated const to, to kind of do all the, you know, one implementation. So anyway, that was one thing to, to point out. But sorry, thank you. Sorry I like, like did the come back on stage thing. But there you go. <laughs> So uh, Haskell, it was the, the first place encountering that sort of thing. Um, and, then, and then in Rust, and again, this is probably, this is probably overkill. This, in six months, this will probably be determined a mistake right, right, to do right. this. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but, so there's tutorials. Out there are tutorials, yeah. Search for phantom data, yeah. and, and you'll, see, you'll see all sorts of stuff like, like this. In fact, there was a blog post a couple of years back that uh, looked at Rust for state machines, and and they I think that that, that that's per the inspiration for for this sort of thing here. So sorry, one more question. You mentioned Haskell. How does I don't know much about phantom types. But how does it relate to uh, dependent types or uh, refinement types? So uh, independent of of both of these, yeah, it's okay. it's, it's kind of orthogonal to. I mean, and maybe not quite orthogonal. Like there's some there's some relation here, like the the whip thing here. Uh, that would be a nice dependent type, right? That's what and, I was thinking would be, when I saw it. Oh, yeah, that looks kind of dependent. Yeah, so so like const generics are kind of a subset of dependent types. But phantom types they only appear in the compiler, right? That's correct. Yeah, and, and they're gone once you're running. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you can have unnamed, unused generic parameters for one thing. So you would have to wrap those in the phantom data and take them. Yes. So, like, if you wanted it to be generic over certain things, but you don't actually use that generic argument. I see. That's yeah, basically yeah. that's why it's called phantom. Yeah, so you have to have it in there syntactically somewhere. I see. But it doesn't do anything with it. Yeah. So you're using that to say this is what this is, but we're never actually using that information. That's yeah. right. So yeah, if you see, no one actually calls it actually compiles it out. That's right. This would be yeah. It's just gone. Zero size. Yeah. It's just gone. Okay, interesting. Would you, would this be a useful use case for something like dependent types? Uh, yeah. For example, like with the width and so forth. Like this, this would that's yeah. This this sort of thing. Dependent types give you a great way of expressing, like taking things that might in other languages be done at runtime and bringing them into kind of pile time checks. Mm -hmm. So Rust gives you some of that, but other languages that have full dependent type support are going to give you more. Okay. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. All right, should I turn my microphone back on? You can keep your... Let me turn mine off. All right, switch over right here. And my microphone is back on. Okay, who wants to go next? Anyone here at the table? Uh, Garrett, did you want to share yours? Yeah, I did one demo. I see you gesturing. Are you muted? Nope. Am I muted? Still can't hear you. Can I you can hear you online, Garrett. Okay. I hear you. Yeah, let's check. Maybe I'm muted. It could be my problem. Just a second. Do, 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 do. Good call. It was me. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Okay. So I did share one thing when we were just here online, but I have a different project that I can share if there's time. Hey, you can do both as far as we're concerned, because we didn't see the first one. Well, kind of, <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll just share very briefly. So right. I kind of hinted at this one, but the idea here is um, so the idea here is uh, we have this interesting problem at work. I'm sure other people have come across this before. Uh, we roll out a deployment, and sometimes we have to do some, something after the deployment has completed successfully. So I deployed my web service. I want to run migrations for the database that 
that service owns. We just want to do it automatically. It's a common pattern. How do we solve that problem in the Kubernetes world? Um, if you go look around, you'll find there's lots of really interesting annotations and triggers and things to say like, oh, when I detect a change, like I'll see you updated your manifest, um, then I will go kick off a job for you. But we didn't want it to be um, something that happens all the time. We said we want something to happen only if the deployment completes successfully, right? And that's kind of, we were struggling to find something and I thought, hey, maybe this is a good opportunity to play with, with Rust. So we wrote at work this thing called uh, DocBot, which is comes from like the, comes from the, the matrix world. Um, but I wanted to at least just point one little thing that was kind of cool, which is if you've uh, ever implemented any kind of like Kubernetes operator controller uh, in the Go world, there's all this like generated code. You're running these make scripts that are just injecting stuff at build time. And honestly, I'm not really sure like what part of the build cycle code is injected in. It's pretty hard to follow. Um, and just to do one quick kind of back step um, in the Kubernetes world, for those who don't work in there, we have this com com uh, concept of like a controller or an operator which is a really fancy way of saying, uh, I would like to know if something changes. And you can uh, you can say like, oh, I want to know if a deployment changes. Anytime, any change to any deployment, just send me a copy of that deployment JSON body, and I will parse it, and I will do something with it. Um, and so really, anytime I say controller or operator, what I'm really saying is a convenient way to subscribe to changes within a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and that's what we're seeing here. But to go back to the first point of in the Go world, um, we have all of this like generated code at build time. It gets really hard to follow. There's a crate called kubers, um, and it's really well done. So you have these strongly typed APIs where I say, hey, I want this API client that covers all namespaces in a cluster, and I specifically want um, the client to target the deployment API. And so just by passing these types around or specifying these type parameters, uh, I'm, I'm almost uh, building the correct API client for the Kube cluster. And from there, I can go see uh, the latest version of stuff. So I don't really care about old things. I just want to know what's recent as of the app starting. And then I can use the API to say, hey, I want to watch for deployment changes. And then I get this little really uh, this kind of tight loop that just says, hey, um, if this thing was added or if it was modified, let's see if it uh, finished deploying successfully. If it hasn't, then I'll wait for the next message when the deployment has finished rolling out. And then uh, this is like a little check that I say, hey, uh, I want to see if this deployment actually changed in contents and it's not hitting some you know, automatic scale up because we're under load. Because I don't need to run the migrations unless the code actually changes. So it's like a convenient way of, of catching that. But then finally, I, I'll say, cool, like create some job. Um, and how this looks or, or another, how this is defined is uh, I say, let's uh, create, I think I have like a test here, kind of deployment hook. Should we be seeing it? Oh, there we go. You're there we go. changing. Sorry. Can you see this now? This like deployment hook? Yeah. Sweet. So what this is, what this is, it's a custom type that we made uh, in Rust. Well, the, we define this from this Rust app that just says, hey, like anytime an app called Nginx finishes deploying, uh, run this pod template. And the pod template defines um, the pod template defines you know the containers, the commands you want to run. This is all like built into the Kube API stuff. So we're not doing anything particularly crazy here. Um, and we also can say like, you know, define the spec inline. And and when you do this, so like if we go into this deployment uh, and change a value, 
uh, and apply it. Uh, I think I need to be in this tab to apply it. And apply it. Um, nothing is going to happen because I, I am not running <laughs> a controller. Let me run this really quick. And then we'll do a uh, quick experiment again. All right, so I'll change the contents of this uh, of this uh, deployment. We'll apply it one more time. And over here on the right-hand side, we'll see uh, Nginx has been deployed. And then I have actually uh, two deployment hooks, both uh, the examples in this, in this project that are running right now. And if we look on the right-hand side, we can see, I'm sorry if it's small, but we can see Nginx has updated. It's running as of 20 seconds ago. And after that completed, we had these two hooks that run. And if we look at their logs, we can see it says doing some work, still doing some work, and done, which is exactly what this pod template defined as a script. Um, so that's like the life cycle of it. Really, really light, but there's not a lot of Rust code here. Um, but I loved working with that strongly typed API client. It's a breath of fresh air coming from the Go side or the Ruby side trying to write a controller there. And again, a controller just means an API client that can subscribe to changes. Sort of like a worker. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Same thing, right? Um, but uh, super cool, like little tiny problem that we came across. I couldn't find a good solution out there. And so in like you know a short period of time, I was able to crank this out. Um, I did want to highlight one really interesting thing of Rust, which is this. Um, one common thing projects use is the build RS, which is built into Cargo. And this is just saying uh, this, this script or this main function here is compiled and run at compile time of the larger project. And um, what I really wanted to do here was say, look, we de define this um, this resource definition or like these types, right? Like I, I said, oh, I want to create this thing called a deployment hook. And I define that in Rust. And then the macros from the kubrs crate will build it out. But one thing that I was having trouble doing was keeping it synchronized because I didn't want to have to generate this thing or hand tweak this thing. And the thing I'm talking about is specifically um, this massive custom resource definition, which is just YAML hell. Uh, from uh, whoa, is that, that like would... forty levels of indentation? <laughs> Dude, it's a yeah, it's a lot. But I'll show you why and why it's really cool, or one thing that's really neat. Um, it's four thousand lines long, almost. It's yes, but I it's because I did that to myself because um, <laughs> one is I said like, hey, it'd be cool on a deployment hook if I can just inline a pod spec, right? I'm like that'd be fun. And so I let myself do that as like, hey, why don't I just allow myself to insert a pod template on this definition? Um, but I didn't want to have to manually type in or copy or indent 4,000 lines of YAML. Um, and I didn't have to because with this build RS script, I can literally say, hey, pull that resource definition, all that Rust code that's generated with all those macros, and then call to YAML on it. Calling to YAML on it will create the custom resource definition um, correctly. And then I can put that into the main directory of my repo. So every time I build the project, it's automatically synchronizing the YAML, which I will upload to the cluster, with the custom resource definition that's defined in my project. So if I were to change, if I were to go in here and add a new field called, I don't know, like YOLO. Um, this may fail to compile because I'm not defining the structure or whatever. But if I could run build on this, build RS will say, great, before I, before I finish anything else, go ahead and update the, uh, oops, not this one, apps uh, go update this 4,000 line YAML file or regenerate it. And uh, when, then when I go check in my changes, this will automatically be up to date. So the one thing I've, the, the two things to take away here are or the three things. One, Rust is really great if you're building in the Kubernetes ecosystem, because the second point I wanted to make, the strongly typed API client is incredible, and I want to use it all the time. And three, 
little things that Cargo offers, like this build RS, uh, make that really complicated Golang flow of make files doing all of these random commands at different stages of the compile time, or like when I say compile time, with through that whole make file craziness, um, really simple. Uh, I just have this very easy to read build RS script that's run at compile time, and I get the same thing, which is an always updated, uh, which would otherwise be tedious uh, at best YAML file, um, and never have to worry about it. So it's awesome. Cool. That's so use Rust to write all your horrible YAML files, is what I heard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, see what awesome. Any questions from anybody? Looking around the table here. Questions? I'm waiting for his uh, blog that he writes on this topic. Oh, waiting for his blog post about it, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't just know. Like that. real quick interjection. Uh, if somebody could just put in the Discord a, a brief description of whatever these lightning talks are, that would be great so that we can tag them in YouTube later. Okay. All right. Thank you, Garrett. All right. Anyone else? Got any more show and tells or lightning talks? I'm getting nothing here at the table. Anything online? Did I miss any? chat things here that was already there okay i guess we're done with the show and tell part so now we'll just chat uh aj should i keep the jitsi on for the chat portion or how do you want this sure go ahead and okay whatever happens happens all right well i'm gonna turn off my camera and i'll leave my mic open you're not in charge of this, AJ. <laughs> oh, we did have a funny comment, by the way. Um, uh, Datman Dark said, YAML, an elegant weapon for a more civilized age. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't feel right to me. It's true. And I will say, it's 4,000 lines of YAML because I realized, oh, if I'm generating the YAML automatically, I'll just drop the pod spec in. I don't, I'm not writing the code. Without it, it was like, 50 lines, but it was still tedious. Um, but knowing that I can just say, take any type in the Kube API ecosystem and just automatically inline the correct um, uh, like open API spec for that particular type was pretty incredible. So I can, I can have anything, use any official Kubernetes resources in my custom type, and it just works, which is really cool. So YAML is Kubernetes serializable format. <laughs> if you use Rust, it doesn't suck, but otherwise, yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, we're done with like the you know program part. So what do you guys want to talk about? Did you see that the the this week in Rust just came out while we're eating pizza? I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I saw it. Oh, hey, uh, there's this really cool, here, I'll even share the screen for this. Share screen. It's on the podcast. The, oh, yeah, there's, there's some there's good podcasts. Where is it? Where is this week in Rust? 4.53? Oh, there we go. This right here, keyword generics. This is so cool. So cool. Well, the point is library authors will be able to write a function once that's generic over async or sync, const or not, and it's just one. Yes. Well, this should be should be one of the one of the key enablers of 
why won't this stupid screen come up? Should be one of the key enablers of like a shared async ecosystem, right? Not not only that, but shared async and sync standard library, right? Oh yeah, they're they're syntax examples like woo, that's a lot of angle brackets. It does. It does. What, what did they get? Oh, is it? Do we have more AWS outages or something? I had it up earlier. I thought I had a tab open still, but can we just go straight to the URL? Did see a lot of blog posts in the last few weeks talking about actually pros like the trade offs that generic tasks can make in order to even work, especially with like Rust's uh, main design and how like it causes rotations sure, sure, with it, sure. and how it could it's be like, a little bit hairy to untangle. Now. Uh, that's awesome. The fact that it's making enough progress to show up here is really, really cool. It is really cool. Quite frankly, I don't know how they implement a tenth of this stuff. <laughs> this is not my strong point. Language the theory. Source <laughs> true. It's true. I'm like, it's true. One of these days, I'm going to look at it just to see how they do it. Well, I look at source code fairly often, but it's usually for a method. Right. right, right. <laughs> I saw a really interesting one today. I was looking at the source code for the stringify macro and if you look at the source code for the body of it it has a comment that says compiler built in it's it's been fun so it actually has the macro there in the standard library but then the body of the macro is compiler built in. so it must be like it must be like special case that like when they're processing that macro that, well it's a campfire built in and so it's like oh i know that one Something. So yeah, I'm not I'm not certain on the, the specs for the expands. What do you mean? But I can post. I can look it yeah, up. Yeah, print macro. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It means it's in Rust C. It's not in the standard library. Oh. There we go. I got I got I got the page to finally come up. Yeah. We all go to the page at the same time and load that. <laughs> right, that's what we need to do. One, that's two, three, hit the button. <laughs> well, it's funny. I, I was teaching a, a, a Rust session at uh, OSCON. It was it was a hands-on workshop. So everyone had their laptops out, they had tables. I'm like, okay, now, you know, go do, like, what? It was like little initial steps. Like, like add this thing to your cargo.toml and do cargo run. And then, like... This IT guy comes running yeah, into the room, yeah, like, what are you guys doing? You're using all the internet, all the conference internet. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, shoot. And like, yeah, yeah. the next time I did that workshop, I had all these pre conference instructions sure, sure. for like, go run all yeah. this stuff first so you get all your stuff downloaded because the conference center internet is pretty pitiful. Oh, wow. Oh, I just realized this is going to be the last Rust meetup before Rust Comp. You're right. Rust Comp's next week. Who's going? We should come visit us in camera sometime. We'll see you. Thanks for coming, Alfie. Thanks for coming, Laura. I'm attending virtually. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah? Okay. There's a Reddit, a Rust Reddit. That Scott's job posting uh, like once a month, and then if you leave a comment on there, people will actually reach out to you as well. I've got yeah. I'm in the interview process for two different jobs Ooh. because of a comment that I nice. left on that thread, and they reached out to me. So this this week in Rust has got a job section every week. They actually use the subreddit thread now. Really? Yeah, I've been following it closely because I really want a Rust job. Interesting. Interesting. All right. Well, good luck. Good to, good to meet you. Wow. Oh, yeah. Anyway, keyword generics. Looks awesome. Yeah. Looks awesome. Jitsi. Where's Jitsi? Jitsi's a different browser than Bob. No? Yeah. Firefox. Oh. 
full screen. That's right. All right, I'll stop sharing my screen. If anybody else wants to share screen, go ahead. Wait, AJ and AJ and JoJo Bike. Uh, Garrett went by. Andrew left. Yeah, we're just in the in the post. The post. <laughs> oh, speaking of the unconference, they put it on freaking Saturday, and they didn't announce it till like what a month or more, two months after registration opened. I had my flights booked and everything. Not to mention it's a freaking Saturday. Oh, the unconference sure, sure. after Rust Comp, basically another day of just like everyone getting back together. Check out the team, obviously. I would like to be there. Thank you very much. Put it on a freaking weekday and tell us about it before we schedule our flights. Come on. I'm only attending virtually, so I'm missing out anyways. Oh, I'm going to be on a plane, so I can't even attend virtually. <laughs> right. Sure. That'll work real well. The unconference is only in person. Well, I'm not surprised because it's not. It's not. What's that word? Yeah, we've got set up, yeah, yeah. planned. That's the whole yeah, point. We're doing those specialized. Uh, so I'm more the jack one of these days, I want to like do some for one of these years. I want to attend in person and actually go. So if I work at a trusted company, thanks for coming. If I work at a company that just does rust, they're probably more likely to pay for me to go out there. Yeah, which unfortunately, I was told that you have you can only ask questions through the virtual conf. You can't ask questions there in person. Really, I think most of the talks, not all of them were pre-recorded anyways. What? Really? Yeah, a lot of people pre-recorded them. I've been following some of the conference speakers who are so excited that it's been recorded. Well, one of the nicest things about going in person is to actually see it happen live. I hope it's not all pre-recorded. What the what the heck am I going there for? I don't want to sit there and watch a screen. They rented out a theater for the conference. You're you're depressing me. Stop it. It'll be fun. It better be fun. I I'm using my one conference a year for this. For this one day when I could have done a week long conference. Yep. Yep. Shortening this thing. One day this year. Awesome. What? It's on a Friday. That's cool. That's awesome. Oregon, Portland, Portland Convention Center. I like Portland in the summer. If I have to go somewhere in the summer, I'd rather go to Portland than Austin. Hasn't it been in Portland like every year? Not every year. <laughs> it was. In, oh gosh, I'm thinking Ruscom. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oscom, which is often in the exact same place in Portland. <laughs> Sometimes it was. Other yeah. Good. Good to like the O'Reilly Open Source Convention, but they stopped. O'Reilly shut down all of their in person. They shut down the whole division that did in person conferences when COVID started. Like they, like not temporarily, they axed. Yeah, I was so upset because O'Reilly conferences were my favorite. Anyway, pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't even done every job that I've been counseling at. Like, Someone wants to stitch on the light? They've yeah. talked about it, so I've never heard of it. I haven't even tried it. I know you. I don't know where I know you from. Yeah. 
I want to use it more. So there's actually right. so you you know, you you a solution for sending the architecture from here to the center. Okay, anyway, you look really familiar. I feel like I've had some other phase of life. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. They, they make it a pretty nice, like, like Q&A session. Right. So, yeah, yeah, you think about it. Everybody is going to clap at me. This year, they've got a, a, a Rust Arcade. And I was, I was trying to get my thing ready for it, but as you can see, it's not playable. So I didn't get it, I didn't get it on. There's not an objective yet. Well, yeah, that's that's what I consider playable. Like, oh, okay. There's an objective or something to do. It's a game demo. Uh, yeah, but they loaded it with a bunch of other actual playable games. The Rust Arcade. Someone built their own arcade box and they loaded their own computer in there and then they're preloading it with a bunch of Rust games. That's awesome. Games awesome. that people wrote in pure Rust with Bevy or something else. So. If only my thing was playable, but it's awesome. It also only has one stick, though. Yeah, yeah. So I actually spent like two of my nine days trying to do a one stick mode, and it was actually really freaking hard. That's what got me off. That's part of what got me into like I need to use an input manager, and then I'm like, oh crap, the input manager doesn't support axes, axes, and then oh crap, it doesn't do turning uh -huh. how it should. So like, I spent all this time like contributing to that. I'm like, that all working great, and then I got tired, and we did vacations and stuff, and I didn't go get any further progress. Stupid. Do you do a lot of other game for and stuff? What's that? Have you, have you done a lot of other game dev and stuff before? Well, a lot? No. A long time? Yes. A long time? Excellent. <laughs> I spent a couple of years with Unity. I spent a couple of years with Unreal Engine. That's awesome. Before that, I spent a couple of years with Pygame and Piglet. Huh. What kind of games do you like to make? Um, I like to make... Yeah, I haven't really finished much, except for with Unreal, I can finish a couple. Okay. I'm still struggling on the, on the, make something fun. Yeah. yeah I want it to be fun. I, I'm good at the technical parts. Like, I run into all these these tooling problems, sure. and I, I automate my builds, and I contribute patches for for different mathy things, and and then, like, I don't finish. But this time, I'm using, I'm using the proceeds from my online courses. Like, I hired a a pixel artist. Okay, cool. To make like those, the yeah, sprites those that you good. saw, those are awesome. Oh, thanks. Well, th those were the ones I made. Well, they're awesome. They're fun. <laughs> yeah, the, the one the pixel art has made it was be is better. I haven't integrated those yet. Sure, sure. He did it while I've been not doing things. So I've got a bunch of sprites sitting there that I need to try to oh. do stuff with. So, like my next thing, honestly, though, is going to be like. Like you saw those triangles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those took me hours to set those stupid triangles for the for the collisions. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So like my next thing is I'm going to look for some way, some tool that will let me automate setting the colliders. And when I don't find it, I'm gonna need to write the tool. And so that's probably going to be my next five days of work. Of, like, this will be ready for next year. I would look for a tool. Yeah. This is going to be ready for like next year's Rust conference. That's what I'm aiming for. Exactly. So in terms of like making it fun, like what what are you looking to do? Like what's the experience you're? Uh, well, I sort I sort of told you that like Stardew Valley. -ish. Stardew Valley feelings but not the walking around rpg more of the more of the mechanics okay. and the, the top down space uh -huh. i want it to be a little arcadey but not shooting okay like th that's when i say stardew valley like i mean like yeah. i want to be doing something like productive like i want to be going to the a these asteroids and like setting up some level mining things. maybe a little yeah. bit of factorial like okay like produce a, like set stuff up that produces things which yeah. produce things that you hook up to things and then you make like so that progression okay. of something 
Yeah. Yeah. Like Stardew Valley Dyson Sphere. Uh, yeah. I, I do. I, I do. Would like there to be like a little bit of a like. I'm not going for like completely pacifist. Sure. But I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to turn it into like a. Well, I'm just going to shoot the whole game. Are you? But are you I do going, think like a little bit of survival mode would okay. be neat, where it's like, okay, I need yeah. to set up defenses on these sure. asteroids. They'll yeah. take care of the shooting yeah. part. Yeah. But then the it's going to cost yeah. something to run them, so I've got to mine stuff to okay. supply them, and then if I mine enough or efficiently enough then I can upgrade their power yeah. or I can upgrade my mining abilities okay. and expand my little sphere of yeah. influence <laughs> so what's that Star 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 yeah oh I like I like that description that's yeah fun. that's a great way to think or, about it or you can, yeah, you awesome. can have it you land on an asteroid and it teaches you a skill like this is yeah. how you do your taxes yeah. like, this okay. is how you okay. do a poor loop like when you get to that asteroid you're thinking a little bit like sieve texture <laughs> there's also this game called let's see how big we can make this little game that's right so you're <laughs> awesome. doing factorio there's like this uh -huh. version of a game called dyson sphere program where you're Ooh. like actually making a dyson sphere Oh, that's hilarious. over time, but it's like Factorio, but for a Dyson sphere. That's cool. Oh, that's so maybe cool. like doing something similar to that on the asteroid, yeah. where it's like Stardew Valley, but you're making a Dyson sphere and you need to keep it safe from other stuff. So yeah. it's like the Tower Defense StarCraft, and then it's like the thing you're protecting. Yeah. Like something like that. I think what he's got is cuter. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. definitely. <laughs> so I, I lean, lean in all the way. You, you, like, yeah. you like my style, yeah. my, my yeah. retro yeah. pixel that's style? Yeah. 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 Starting like, Valley. You right can make a lot of money. Yeah. You need the heart of Starting Valley. Well, like, and there's no relationship. I had no idea. You, well, I'm not sure about that part. I just don't know. You could be other astronauts. Okay, you sold me. we got to have relationship system in that. Like, anyway, that's awesome. Like a robot. <laughs> Good luck. I would like to be able to like you get to an asteroid and then it's like boom, you're on the asteroid. You get out of your ship and you do the little more Stardew Valley like stuff. Right? Or maybe you have like a you know like the old Zelda two uh -oh. yeah. NES, like you drop into a two D platform. I'm like, oh right? yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Why am I not? Why am I not a fashion? Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> all the things, all the We're doing everything. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. going to have spreadsheets yeah. built in. I heard of this guy in China. No, I don't know. Guy. I, I really do want to try to get some like little things. MVP. They have like a yeah. And then, yeah. like, I'm totally okay. If it gets playable and it's like, wow, I, I Pac Man it yeah. and it's fun, like, that'll be enough. And then, but I'm. But yeah, I'm just going to keep going forever. Like I'll make another project. Or extend it. Or what is your MVP? What that is like, like central mechanics. So that's for what? Oh, for an MVP? So obviously you saw that I chose to be, I'm in the ship, right? We pop down. So MVP is going to be some, like you go to the asteroid, interact with it somehow. You mine it somehow with, I don't know, a laser, a grappling I don't know, being something. Um, and some little upgrade loop of, like, that's what a lot of the sprites are, is different ships. Yeah. So some kind of earning, upgrading your ship to more okay. stuff that lets you earn more, some kind of loop there. I haven't figured out, like, what's your adversary in, or, you know, what's the, what's the thing that you're battling against in that scenario? Either metaphorically yeah. or literally. Yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. Well, cool. That's awesome. Thanks for showing. Up. Yeah. If anyone would like to like participate in any way, like I'm totally open. I am. I am doing it closed source because I have this dream that one day. This is my dream that I started in 2007. One day I will pr produce a commercially viable game, and I will flip, and that will be my day job, and I. Well, I won't have boring day jobs anymore. But <laughs> we'll see. Good luck. Some more side projects. I'll pop up. Yeah, I want to. I've been really wanting to be try heavy. Okay. Yeah, we just yeah. got to figure out. Like, I, like, just call it yeah. I know. It's like, it's like they're going to do something. They're going to do something. They're gonna do something. They didn't do anything. Yeah. And then Bevy came and just put the nail in the top. So it's like, yeah. oh, someone's actually doing something. Everyone knew. Amethyst at least is giving a lot of money. They, they gave all the inspiration. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So you start this year, but I'm really excited about it. Yeah, so I'm going to be like the job of the year. So the next year.
yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, it's probably a little early for us. Okay. But let's send me an email or, or take me on Discord or something. Very and I'll set you up on the scouts, like what you want to do and like if you want to be compensated or do whatever. At least something like that. Pretty open. A couple of them. Because like, yeah, it'll just be 10 audio. Are you on the Discord? I'm also. Uh, I'm not. Yeah, I should join. I, I just barely. Uh, I used to live here. Better be my last couple of years. Just for the <laughs> yeah. So, okay. so, yeah. Yeah. Is there, is there I'll just to... agree in writing what we're going to um, do. I, I'm, yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm pretty yeah. loosey goosey, yeah. but I, yeah. I'm always careful. Yeah. Put it in writing. It's like this is a commercial yeah. thing. So you agree to like not share the source code or take it away, but like you can do whatever we agree to, and I will compensate you if we agree to compensation. So yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's being like yeah. tomorrow or something. Yeah. Yeah. I'll probably go to the next day. My wife said, I haven't done anything for two weeks. But it looks really, really I mean, it's cool. Like, yeah, it's yeah, fun. Yeah. Yeah. I just like, it, it goes in these spurts where it'll be like, like, uh, like uh, boom, I got an asteroid. Boom, it's moving. Boom, I got a ship. Boom, I can control it. And then it's like three weeks of I'm working on the input manager. And then two weeks of I'm not even touching it. I'm tired. Right. That's kind of how. I'm kind of glad that I've signed up for this company class yeah. a bunch of times in yeah. spring, yeah. summer, and fall because now it's giving me a lot of time to have those spurts <laughs> with the entire project. Jason so you gotta do a little sprint and then the mice say, Yeah, just like, a, hey, this is taking a couple of weeks. And I'll also have to score that. So I'm good to do that. I was just, I was just, I Hey, Jay, it looks like you're shutting down Jitsi. Is that true? So, be an extra user of that never got kicked out all the way. Okay, I'm going to shut down Jitsi. Bye. The, 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 that's all, folks.